Genesis chapter one, beginning in verse one. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and the darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then if we go down to verse six and continue reading, it says, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. <clears throat> I want you to notice that in the reading from this first chapter of Genesis, how many times the element of water is mentioned. In the first 10 verses of Genesis chapter one, um, heaven is mentioned three times, earth four times, light or day is mentioned eight times, but water is mentioned 10 times. Water is certainly the dominant element in God's creation as far as our planet earth is concerned. 70 to 75 percent of the earth's surface is covered by water. Some other interesting facts about water, 97 percent of all water is contained in the oceans, and only three percent of the earth's water can be used for drinking, and three quarters of that three percent of drinkable water is frozen in the polar ice caps. So it's no wonder that access to clean water for drinking, for bathing, and irrigation is a key to prosperity for any country. Now next to oxygen, it is the most necessary element to support life in all of its forms. It's no wonder then that God uses water as a key symbolic element in spiritual life as well. As a matter of fact, it is the most used symbol in connection with the miracle of salvation in the Bible. For example, the great flood in Genesis chapter seven. Water here is used to execute judgment. Those above the water in the ark, they're saved and those below the water who refuse to enter the ark are drowned. And so water separates the living from the dead and the ark is the facilitator. Another example of water being used in the process of salvation. Moses and the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14, I'm using examples that are familiar to all of us. Again, water is the key element dividing those saved from those destroyed. Moses, before parting the Red Sea to allow the Israelites to escape the pursuing Egyptians says, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord which He will accomplish for you today. It's in verse 13. So note that Moses refers to the parting of the waters not as a miracle, which it certainly was, but rather as salvation. Water, once again, being the difference between safety and destruction. The Jews walking through the parted waters and escaping the Egyptian army, and the same water drowning the Pharaoh and his army as they tried to follow the Israelites through that same water with Moses performing the miracle. Another example of water being used in this salvation motif, if you wish, Joshua and the crossing of the Jordan River in Joshua chapter three and four. Of course, this is a less familiar story, but nevertheless, a powerful example of God's use of water in connection with salvation. 
We know the story. After 40 years of wandering in the desert and the deaths of Aaron and Moses and the first generation of people who had left Egypt, Joshua now is the leader and Joshua is told to lead the people into the promised land. Now they could have come into the land through a land route through the south. They could have come into the land of Canaan, if you wish, using a, a, southern, uh, a southern route. But God has them enter the land from the east, which requires them to cross the Jordan River. And so the Lord tells the priests to carry the ark into the river, and as they do, as they step into the Jordan, the waters separate. And the priests remain in the middle of the separated waters, and the people are then instructed to cross over onto the dry riverbed as the priests remain in the middle holding the ark, and the people pass in front of them and cross over to the other side. Once everyone has crossed safely over, the priests then make their way to the other side as well, and the river once again rushes by. In this instance, the water separates the past life with its suffering and death in the desert from the new promised life of abundance and blessing, the promise fulfilled. So it's interesting to note that God uses the priests as the intermediaries between the old and the new, and these two being separated by water. And then of course the passage that I was talking about this morning, a familiar passage to all of us, actually used it not only in my sermon but in my Bible class as well, and that's in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, another very familiar passage. Of course, we have water baptism used by John and Jesus to announce and prepare the people for the arrival of the kingdom of God. And then after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, the apostles preach water baptism in Jesus' name as the point where all past symbolisms all meet at the same time. In the past, God rescued and transported them to safety and the promised blessings through the miracles using water. But now He performs another miracle, this time in the water, and this time it's in the water of baptism. He grants each person who enters into the water by faith in Jesus Christ the right to be called sons of God and live forever. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Now, in the Old Testament, God performed miracles with water. The worldwide flood, um, the separation of the Red Sea and the separation of the Jordan, those were miracles that He did with water. And he did it as a sign pointing to himself as the savior of his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 29, the writer says, Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. In the New Testament, in Jesus' baptism, God performs a miracle in the water granting eternal life as a gift to all those who believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. New Testament says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, John 3, 5. And then a little later, it says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. In every case, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, there is the water, there is a miracle, and there is a salvation of some kind. 
Now when it comes to baptism, I don't think that God simply took a natural thing, you know, like water, and used it to make a spiritual point, salvation. God knew the plan of salvation before the founding, before the creation of the world. Ephesians chapter one, verse four. His choice of water in this plan was not some afterthought. He wasn't just making up stuff as he went along. Hey, what a great idea, we got all this water. Man, it'd be a good idea if we took the water. Hey, water, they're going to get it. There's so much water. I wish I, I should have thought of this before. That's not how it works. That's not how God works. I'm persuaded that he created the element of water with the ultimate purpose of making a spiritual point. In other words, the fact that we need water to survive as humans is secondary to its use in the plan of salvation. The natural water was created to serve the spiritual salvation, baptism. Now I say this to underscore the importance of baptism in a world that continually undermines its importance. We need to remember that baptism is not a religious afterthought. Oh yeah, you believe in Jesus and yeah, you want to serve the Lord. Oh, by the way, you know, did I, did I, did I forget to mention baptism? Six months or a year or two years after you've you know, confessed Christ. Oh, Shouldn't have done that. It, baptism is not an afterthought. It's not a, a cultural relic from another period. One argument that I've heard is that, well, baptism, you know, that was a Jewish thing. You know, the Jews had a lot of cultural rights and so on and so forth. And you know, it belonged to the culture of that era. We're so past that now. We're not a Jewish culture. We're, we don't use water as a you know, symbolic right, so why should we even bother with it? I mean, if it makes you feel good, like our Pentecostal friends, they see baptism in water as simply something that edifies you. If it's edifying to you, if it makes you feel good spiritually, go ahead and do it, it's a good thing. Can it hurt? That's not our idea. We don't see baptism as a cultural relic from another period, and it's not simply a symbol that we can choose to ignore if we want to become, uh, if we want to rather, because we are so spiritually mature that we're beyond symbols. Another argument that I've heard. Baptism is the historic time and place where we cross over from death to life, from condemned to save. Just as a very real flood separated the living from the dead, and a very real Red Sea divided the Israelites who lived from the Egyptians who died. Just like the Jordan River, the real Jordan River, stood between the old life of wandering in the wilderness from the new life in the promised land. The Jews did not come to a symbolic Jordan River. <laughs> they came to the actual river that needed to be crossed. And so in the same way, the very real water of baptism here and now separates those who are saved and will live eternally from those who will be condemned eternally. You know, I emphasize this idea of history because it's so important. And sometimes we, we, don't, we don't see the historic nature of salvation. Jesus Christ, a real person, who lived and breathed and walked on this earth, who died a very real death, historically recorded. Jesus' death is not a myth, it's not a symbol. If we lived at that time, 
We could note the calendar day that it happened. We could note the time that it took place. We could remember, just like 9-11 or other great tragedies, where, where I was you know, when Jesus died, if we lived at that time. This thing called the crucifixion happened in history. Imagine, God goes through all the trouble of inserting Himself into human history, taking on flesh, starting out as a baby, not even as a man, but as a baby, and, and living a true historic life that brings Him to a historical moment where He dies historically on the cross. God enters history to pay the price for our sins. How can we, in good conscience, deny the history of our own baptism? I like to say, if Jesus died on the cross in history, then I certainly can die in the water in history. Not symbolically, not mystically, but historically. His death and His resurrection has a date on the calendar. And my death and my resurrection in the waters of baptism also have a date on the calendar. And so this sermon is called Miracle in the Water. Not because the water itself has any miraculous power, that's, that's magic. That's the occult. It's called miracle in the water because the miracle happens in the water. And you might ask, well what miracle is that? And the miracle I'm talking about is the forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, future, all of our sins forgiven. Where? In the water. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, do I understand exactly metaphysically, do I understand how the Spirit of God dwells within me? How does a spirit being dwell in a physical being? How do I, do I get that? Can I draw that? Can a, is someone here an engineer that could draw a schematic to show me how that works? I don't understand how that works. But I think it classifies as a miracle, or it qualifies rather as a miracle, the Spirit of God dwells in me. And when does that happen? In the water. And the result of eternal life because of this happens where? In the water. And so the water merely marks the time and the place that the miracle happens. It doesn't cause the miracle. God is the one who causes the miracle. But I can tell you that I go to sleep at night and I remember the day and the hour and the history of the time in my life when the miracle happened to me. So no matter when or where the water appeared, the flood, the Red Sea, the Jordan, baptism, it always required faith in order to enter in. Faith, for example, that you would be safe in the ark. Faith that you would be saved from the Egyptian army if you walked through the Red Sea. Faith that God was leading you to the promised land and not an attack by the powerful Canaanites if you crossed the Jordan. And finally, and most importantly for us, faith that Jesus is the Son of God and will raise you up on the last day if you meet Him with repentance in the waters of baptism. 
So what will it be for you tonight? Will this be the time and the place in the history of your life when you crossed over from death to life in the waters of baptism? If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and are ready to make a change, then come. The miracle in the water is waiting for you. If you need to make a response to this or any other offer of grace that the Bible presents to you, then I encourage you to come forward now as John leads us in our song of invitation.